welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, and I'm a wellbeing and lifestyle coach, EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and passionate about helping more women to understand and accept their amazing ADHD brains. After speaking to many women just like me, and probably you, I know there is a need for more health and lifestyle support for women newly diagnosed with ADHD. In these conversations, you'll learn from insightful guests, hear new findings, and discover powerful perspectives and lifestyle tools to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm, and purposeful life wherever you are on your ADHD journey. Here's today's episode. So hi everyone, welcome back to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. Now I had to do an intro for this episode because it was pretty much a career and life highlight for me. I recently read an amazing book and the book was called The Well-Lived Life and it was written by Dr. Gladys McGarry and she is a 102-year-old doctor. I have to say that it really, really touched me on every level from the holistic sort of medical level, but also on a spiritual soul level. And I had heard her on different podcasts. She's done the most incredible publicity situation all around the world. And I reached out to her team and I just kind of thought, you know what, if you don't ask, you don't get. And the reason why I reached out to her team is because when I read her book, she talked about being diagnosed with dyslexia. And she talked about the way she was as a child, as a girl, how she broke through barriers. She was so ahead of her time. And I definitely spotted some neurodivergent traits there. And I thought, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to see if she'd like to come on the podcast. Anyway, very quickly, I heard back from her team and they said, yes, absolutely. So today's podcast features Dr. Gladys McGarry. And as I said, she is 102 years old. She's just released this incredible book, The Well-Lived Life, and she's still a consulting doctor. And she's been recognized as a pioneer of the allopathic and holistic medical movements. She's also a founding diplomat of the American Board of Holistic Medicine and is the co-founder and past president of the American Holistic Medical Association, as well as the co-founder of the Academy of Parapsychology and Medicine, and the founder of the International Academy of Clinical Hypnosis. She has packed a huge amount into her 102 years old, and the wisdom that comes out of her mouth in this interview, I can't wait for you to hear. We really sort of tap into... I guess her unacknowledged neurodivergence as a child, but now how she sort of sees that and has embraced it. She now lives and works in Scottsdale, Arizona, and for many years she shared a medical practice with her daughter. She currently has a medical consulting practice and maintains a healthy diet and enjoys a good piece of cake every now and then. And what you can't see in this podcast is how fantastic she looked. We recorded this, I think it's about 8 or 9 a.m. her time, Her hair was done, she was beautifully presented, and she was more articulate than me in certain (laughs) certain parts of the interview. So I believe this is a real gem, and I can't wait to share this with you because her wisdom and her insights from her 102 years of being on this planet are truly profound. Enjoy. It's an absolute honor to have Dr. Gladys here in with me recording. It's about eight o'clock your time. Absolutely. It's four, yeah, four o'clock in the UK. You've got up. Um, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. And I'm just so excited to talk to you um, for, for so many different reasons. But I read your book, The Well-Lived Life, and it really moved me. And I've not read a book like this since. And I know that you sort of, it's a similar, a similar vein since I read... Um, Edith Eager's book, The Gift, which I also really, really loved. And it kind of spoke to me in a very similar way. And I'm just delighted to have you here. And I also invited you Uh onto the podcast because a lot of the women I think will relate to your story. And I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit more about that, but there was little pockets in your story, which I know that the ladies who have been recently diagnosed with ADHD will really resonate with and really relate with and really kind of see your brain as something that they can also relate to. So welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank (laughs) you. I'm so honored to be here. Um, First of all, I've never spoken to a 102-year-old before. So for me, this is the biggest honor. (laughs) 
And for someone who looks at least 20 years younger than 102, is there's obviously lots of secrets that hopefully you're going to impart with us. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing I want to know is, how have you got to this point writing a book like this? Do you feel, I mean, I guess, do you feel like there's more more to give? Like, was this the main wisdom or do you think there's perhaps more more to offer? Interestingly enough, uh, you know, I've written other books before this, but they've all, all been uh, medically oriented. You know, they were about diseases, not about the diseases per se, but our dealt, how we dealt with diseases. But this was, to me, the essence of what I was trying to say with the other ones and, and the ways in which we could do it, deal with it. But this was why and what was making us reach for that. There was so much, I, 102 years, what, what does that mean? It just means to me that there has been one day after another, after another, after another, all these years when I've been learning stuff and growing and understanding and, and beginning to really appreciate the fact that I'm alive yeah. and that it's that I'm the only one that can do what I'm doing. It's my job to do the job that I came here to do and to share that with others. And, and so it, it's a, such an amazing place to be in the world at this point. And I'm so grateful because I've learned every day has been a learning experience. And that's yeah. 102 years and I don't know how to figure that. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, that was, I, you could really sense that in the book. The wisdom that was in the book was just incredible. Um, I know you've you've broken it down. It says, you know, the well-lived life, 102-year-old doctor's six secrets to health and happiness at every age. You know, to break it down to six secrets, but from what I derive from the book, you know, the main the main elements of life, the, the, the core element is connection joy, creativity, you know, finding that what you, you know, sort of describe beautifully as the juice is like finding what you're good at, finding what you enjoy and leaning into that. And what I love, you know, you sort of give us a little bit of your backstory of how you grew up in India and your parents and this sort of holistic, but very forward thinking childhood and life and how you, you took that into your own medical practice and how you helped, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of people using this very innovative way, but bringing in a very holistic, soul-driven way as well of helping people. And you tell the story that you were obviously held back in class and you felt, you know, stupid at the time that you, you were told that you couldn't move on and you had to stay in the same class and redo it again. And you were diagnosed with dyslexia. I mean, first of all, I didn't even know that at those, you know, those points for a girl to have that diagnosis. How old were you when you actually did figure out it was dyslexia? Oh, my. I may have been uh, in medical school. I don't know. Because the way it was, was that I was just stupid, you know. Mm -hmm. The understanding was that I was a stupid girl in, this, in the class. And all the other kids you know, they thought I was stupid too, and the teacher really did. So I had to repeat first grade twice because I couldn't read. The letters wouldn't stay any place. The numbers were jumped all over the place, and I, I didn't understand what was going on. The blessed part of this whole thing is that that was my schooling, but I had a home where it was completely different. And the place where we lived, when this was in the Himalayas, and the school was a thousand feet down from where we lived, and a, a mile. So every day I went up and down that walk. But in the process of walking up to the place where we lived, I was able to somehow let the rest of this foolishness go, but climb up to where. I was accepted, people understood me. My ayah, who is the, like the nanny, total bundle of love. She 
couldn't read, she couldn't write, she had few teeth. This Indian woman, amazingly, to me, she was the epitome of love. And she'd see me coming up the hill and she'd reach out her arm and she'd say, she'd yell down to, to me as I'm coming up, Idr Al, come here. And so I would go over and tuck in under her shawl and stay there until I could let all that stuff go and become who I really was feeling who I was. Wow. So it was that juxtaposition of who, who are you and what are you and this kind of thing. Yeah. And, but that kind of scarring from being told you're that kind of stupid person is the kind of bruising to the psyche of mm -hmm. people that is uh, hidden and we don't really know. Like gaslighting. Right. It's, it's, it's there. It colors yeah. your life from there on. And I didn't accept that or understand that, that that was real in my life until much later. So the, the actual uh, diagnosing what I had came much, much later than what I really had. In fact, when we started the American Holistic Medical Association, there were 10 of us sitting around the table who had been really reaching for what it was that we were we thought was the heart of of medicine and of the 10 of us six of us were dyslexic Interesting. and we looked at each other and we said well you know the reason we're doing holistic medicine is because we know there's more in the field of medicine that's mm -hmm. being taught and so it was that kind of ongoing constant awareness and connection mm -hmm. with other people who were doing that same path, looking for the same thing. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying echoes so much with what I, you know, speak about with success, with having sort of neurodivergence and ADHD specifically of like, especially with women who are only just getting their diagnoses, you know, much later on in life in their 50s, 60s. And they've had a lifetime of believing the things that they would have heard very similar things that you would have heard at school, that you're stupid, you need to try harder, you're lazy, um, just do things differently. And those layers and layers of, uh, you know, builds this sort of this belief system about themselves. And it's only much later on in life, we're able to kind of start peeling back those layers and start understanding who we are truly, the essence within us. And, you know, the way you describe it in the book and, and just now, it, it just shows is that, thank God, you had love and you had nurturing if within your family, but also with your ayah and how that person, that connection, that love really can carry you through, you know, those difficult times. And, and I just wanted to just say, you know, incredible what you've done and how you've sort of built and nurtured a, a way of working that really suited you and you kind of put two fingers up at the uh, uh the sort of the normal conventional way and you carried on you had this sort of conviction in what you believe so i am now incredibly excited to be able to say that my adhd women's well-being hormone series is now launched it is out there and is available to purchase. Now, this has been made with a lot of love and consideration, speaking to incredible experts and thought leaders, doctors, hormone specialists, to really help you navigate all of this alongside your ADHD. And I want you to learn how to manage all these ongoing energy, hormone and lifestyle challenges that you've been experiencing all your life. We are talking perimenopause, we're talking energy, hormone balancing, nutrition, lifestyle, supplementation, the most important pertinent things you have been experiencing and perhaps not had validated pretty much since puberty. So we are going to be listening to 10 insightful experts and neurodivergence specialists. So they are understanding the intersection between women's health and hormones, ADHD hormones, as they share their wisdom and their tips to help you manage 
your ADHD and your hormonal symptoms. They're going to be guiding and navigating you through all the different issues that we've been experienced from PMDD to endometriosis to energy and burnout crashes to difficult perimenopause to heavy periods to fatigue. I'm asking all the questions that you would need to know if this was your own private consultation with these incredible experts. So I am delivering this all to you in 10 video episodes and you're going to gain so much insight because this is your private consultation to access these experts in their field who really understand neurodivergence in women and hormones and they're going to give you the most up-to-date information and I want to make this as accessible as possible. I know that so many of you listen from all around the world and sadly the medical research, the expertise is not there locally. So this hormone series is really what I have found out that is up to the minute information that you can use, you can advocate for yourself, you can support, empower, and educate yourself, but not only yourself, but your loved ones as well. If you've got teenage daughters who are really struggling right now, this hormone series is going to give you the bolstering and the education that you need to go to your medical health professionals and ask for what you need. Direct them to what tests you, you may want. We're also talking about genetic testing. This is the forefront of medicine at the moment to really understand how your neurodivergence has shown up throughout your life and to be able to support and empower yourself using new lifestyle tools, nutritional help, supplements, but also from internal guidance as well, really tapping into what you know and having trust in your convictions and trust of what you've known throughout your whole life, perhaps hasn't been supported by medical professionals. So you have always deserved better and in this video series, I've spoken to the leading specialists in each of their fields and asked all the questions to empower you to become more of an expert on your hormones, your lifestyle, your energy. And I really hope that you find this whole series as beneficial as I have from speaking to them all. So all the information is in today's show notes, but also head to my website. It's adhdwomenswellbeing.co.uk. You'll see all the information there. It's ADHD womenswellbeing.co.uk. And I really hope this is as helpful to you as I believe it should be. Can I ask, you know, I mean, I'm looking maybe the fifties and the sixties when women still weren't really working, not many women were doctors and very few women were sort of spearheading and trailblazing. Like what was the reaction? Well, actually when I went to medical school, women's medical college in Philadelphia and the 50 of us started, but only 25 of us graduated because we were told that we were going out into the world is going to be so hard that uh, we just had to be tougher than the guys and smarter and all of that. And um, I was looking for more than I was getting in the academic world. And um, the dean of our school, really didn't think I belonged in medicine. She sent me to the psychiatrist twice and the psychiatrist sent me back into the school and said, no, no, go on and said, <laughs> okayed me for continuing to practice. But it was that kind of um, ambiguous loss is the words that people are using now. These hidden parts of ourselves that were lost and and we we didn't know what to do with it so it was um a time of not only that i was a woman but i was asking questions that weren't having answers so what when we started the american holistic medical association what we actually realized that we were doing was gathering together other physicians who were asking the same questions mm -hmm. and getting the same answers. And so it was that missing piece of love and life that was just not being taught and still it is missing in a great much, of, well, much of medicine doesn't really understand that love and life are the great healers. You know, that, that without that, see, all of medicine is based on 
what was going on when I was in medical school was a, a war. You, the, the war started. It's been a war on disease and pain. You want to get rid of disease. You want to get rid of pain. And the thing that that I was so was struggling with, and other colleagues, there are people who have disease processes that they'll never get rid of. But look at what they do. You know, Franklin Roosevelt had post polio syndrome and was in pain all of his life, but he was our president. I mean, this is the kind of thing that it makes me want to reach higher and and longer because I know there's more, even at this point, there's more there to our true humanity. Our true human being is like E.T., reaching for home. Hmm. You know, we're reaching for who we truly are. And it's been buried in this uh, confusion of who we think we are. Mm. And, you know, I think, (laughs) this is just my own thought about this, but I think that when God created us and created the whole world and the universe and all of that, and then he said to us humans, you guys have free will and you have choice. Nothing else does. So I give you dominion over all of this Mm -hmm. and we thought he said i give you dominance (laughs) so we took it and have been using it and abusing it and doing all kinds of things that are confusing the thing what he really meant i give you this so you can protect it dominance means it's mine i'm going to use it control yeah control but the, what, what what we were really given as you look at the fact that we have free will is taking care of taking care of the earth taking care of the world but also of ourselves mm. and learning to love ourselves yeah. and that's a big one it's a big one it really is and um, to be able to to hear this and it really makes so much sense. I mean, you sort of break it down very simply in the book that it really does come down to this love and this connection and really acceptance and just really being kind to ourselves and others around us. And again, I sort of come back through this lens of, of how I work and, and the women you know I, I work with and the community that I work with and many women who are who didn't have that understanding of themselves and they did grow up with a lot of confusion and dysfunction and chaos and not being able to connect to the right people not to be able to sort of connect with themselves most importantly and then they get this new awareness this new way of looking at life and going right this is the way my brain has always worked and this is why I've been fighting against things that don't feel good to me and then they get this sort of self acceptance and a lot of self compassion and self love and they go okay so there's never been anything wrong with me it's just that my brain has wanted to work differently according to what has been sort of the conformity right. the society conformities on me And you talk about, you know, you were just saying then about connection and like-mindedness and everything. And I think about, you know, the different blue zones around the world of where people thrive the most. You know, I think there's one in Sicily and, but it's very often much older people drinking tea together, having family around them, having young children around them, eating together, walking, carrying things. Like you said that when you lived in India and you were walking up the steep mountains in the Himalayas, you know, that for you as a child to get that exercise, that energy would have been, you know, compared to the children nowadays who don't do anything and they sit on phones and iPads and they barely walk to the bus stop. I'm thinking of my children. Um, And you kind of think, well, what something needs to change now? Something has to change. So it's fascinating to hear. The change of perspective, it's like my first two years were this whole thing that you stupid one. But when I got into third grade, I had a teacher that saw something in me that the others had not seen. So she appointed me class governor. Of course, this is in India where... 
And I had the opportunity to present what we in third grade were doing to the whole student body. And I could do that. I could talk. I could read, but I could always talk. So, uh, so that was my job. And we had a play that we were presenting to the whole student body. And because I was older than the other kids, because I was held back and so on, I was the one that was the frog that jumped over the pond. And so my mother made me a suit and, and dyed it green and so on. So I was the frog. And I walked out on the stage very confidently. I was, I knew what I was going to do and all of that. But as I stepped onto the stage, my two older brothers were in the front row of the audience and it threw me off my spe my pacing enough that instead of jumping over the pond I landed in it so I'm standing in this pond crying like I'm what eight years old not seven or eight years and tears running down my cheeks I can't move I've just you know totally destroyed everything that I had created in my mind I was and I just I'm standing the audience is hysterically laughing they're laughing so loud the teacher has to come and lead me off the stage and when I come home at night I'm sitting at the dinner table and my two brothers are telling my mother how funny this was, how hysterical it was. And I'm giving them the dead eye, which <laughs> wasn't going any place. You know? <laughs> anyway, finally, my mother says, all right, boys, you've had your fun. Now, what can we as a family do to help Gladdy in case this happens anytime again in her life? where people will laugh with her, not at her. Mm. And this mother of mine was so amazing because she could take things and with just a little twist, give a whole different context to it. And there have been many times with dyslexia, you're kind of clumsy. You can stumble and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There have been many times when I've come up to a stage and I've stumbled or done something that was not. <laughs> very I relate. Tight. I relate. <laughs> yeah. So, but I've always been able to take that something, whatever it was, and say something like, oh, I'm such a drama queen or something, and then go right into what I was going. So I hardly have to introduce myself. The, the actual fact that people are, are laughing when I start my talk, we're into the whole thing. Yeah. See, my mother had that amazing gift of taking that. It's like a week before she died and she was in her late nineties and we were sitting out on the porch and looking at the garden. And she says to my dad, look at that petunia bush. It has at least 400 blossoms on it. My dad says, oh, Beth, there can't be more than 40. She says, what's another zero? <laughs> I mean, you know, taking <laughs> things and just one little twist like that, making it acceptable. And you know what, what a jewel to allow myself to follow through on finding those special jewels that change things. Yeah. Not just for myself, but change it for everybody that's around. Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing gift. Very. I mean, your mum sounds incredible, a great role model, but also I can hear that she was a great advocate as well. She she helped you sort of step into and be proud of who you are and help you reframe those those moments which could have lasting imprint on, on you. Yeah. And I've, I've seen it many times, again, with sort of clients of mine who are terrified of public speaking. And I use something called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. It's the tapping. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a very, um, it's a very good technique to really sort of go back to memories and to identify why that fear 
that belief is there. And very often it comes from something exactly what you just described of being eight years old and being laughed at in an assembly or a presentation and they fell off the stage. And from then to the age of sort of 50, they can't speak in public because that eight-year-old self just comes back and says, well, everyone laughed at you. But you had that moment where if your mum hadn't reshifted that, reframed that for you, that potentially could have changed the course of your life. You're, you know, you may Absolutely. not have had that confidence. So she she sounds incredible. Um, and, and often, unfortunately, it is very, you know, down to luck with success, with thriving, with ADHD, dyslexia, that type of thing, because we have a parent that believes in us or um, an adult or anyone, a guardian. You Like you said, you had a teacher. Sometimes it's that teacher that really says, I can see something in you. I can see the, the potential. And they direct the student to trying something or what if you didn't fail? What if this turned out to be great? And it often just takes that one spark, that one person. And it sounded like you had a couple of those to steer you. But oh, importantly, yeah. I feel like you had this inner resourcefulness and inner resilience that kept pushing you and allowing you to keep going and evolving. It was a matter of watching what my parents were doing and seeing the response, the, the, the whole community in the villages of North India. They, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. My parents didn't have amazing technology or x-rays or machine or anything. They had nothing but a few uh, things that they could use, but they had everything in the love and caring with which they used what they had. And it was, my mother called it make do. You know, you use what you have and you make do with love and with caring. And if, if you don't, life gets stuck. And when life gets stuck, it dies. So life has to keep moving. And in the whole process of keeping it moving, it's the reality within our own being as we're working with somebody else as to what it is that we're reaching for. It's like my oldest son is a retired orthopedic surgeon. And when he'd finished his training, he came through Phoenix and he was just on his way down to Del Rio, Texas, where he was going to start his practice. And he said, Mom, I'm real scared. He said, I'm going to go into the world and have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But if you can understand that you are trained to do this amazing work, which which is orthopedic surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when we get some part of our body that needs an orthopedic surgeon working on it, we don't want a lesser person. You know, we know we want that kind of, of understanding and work mm -hmm. done with what, what it is that needs to be fixed. But when you've done your job and done the best that you can, then you turn the healing over to the patient because the physician within them has to take that that you are giving them and make it work. It won't work unless the patient accepts what you have done, mm -hmm. accepts it and takes it in and says, okay, yeah, well, I'll do what you've told me or I'll work with, I'll do the stretching, whatever it is and then works with what you have told them and then does the healing. Because otherwise, you know, where is it going to go? Yeah. Yeah. I totally, I totally see that in sort of a different capacity of if you want things to change in your life, you know, you can go and seek the help and have the therapy and the coaching and all of that. But there is a, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, work that we need to do with, you know, that inner work, we have to sort of make that um, decision that things are going to change. We're going to make those sort of incremental shifts every day, like something has to be tweaked. 
And I do believe that when we're ready, it happens. But if we're not, like if we try and help other people when they don't really want our help, or we try and, you know, I'm sort of think about certain members of my family where, you know, they're sort of trying to push people down one avenue, but actually that person has to want to, to do that thing themselves. And it can be very hard, you know, as a family member, but sometimes the, they have to be ready. The patient has to be ready to, to do the inner healing themselves as well. In the medical world, when the patient accepts the fact that they have a colleague, the, the physician within themselves, mm -hmm. that is working with the doctor on the outside, that, and the doctor on the outside accepts the colleague that is working with the patient, then you've got a team and healing could happen. If either one of those doesn't do, the, do their job well, mm -hmm. the healing doesn't happen as well. So it's not a matter of is allopathic medicine the right one or chiropractic or orth, orth you know, it's not the, the modality that's the most important. It's the way that modality is being used. Yeah in relationship to the acceptability that the patient can have of working with that doctor. You know, it's, it's that allowing that love healing force move together. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I think, I, I've come up with what I call the five L's. I had to have some kind of structure in which to form, <laughs> which I could, you know, uh, extend the thinking that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with these five L's. The first is life. If we don't have life, we don't have anything. You know, it's like a, a seed in the pyramid. Uh, it's there for 5,000 years and it doesn't do anything until water and sunlight and caring from some place else accept is is accepted by that seed the shell cracks and life starts it's had all the energy of the universe stuck mm -hmm. within that shell until love activates it when love activates it then it moves and grows and does what it can so love and life are integral to each other if we're going to live without love, we've got a real problem. It, but if we live with life, life is, oh, it's a wow. The third, the second, uh, so those two go together. Life mm -hmm. and love are integral to each other. The third one is laughter. Laughter without love is, uh, you know, it's mean, it's cruel, it's, it's, really not nice but laughter with love is joy and happiness and the fourth is drudgery i, I mean it's, the fourth l is labor labor without love is drudgery it's mm -hmm. too many diapers i have to i gotta go to work this is too you know it's dragging this load of, it's just too hard but labor with love Mm -hmm. is bliss it's why you do what you're doing it's why i do it it's why singers sing why painters paint it's it's that inner life that is there that needs to be expressed it's it's reaching out it is bliss mm -hmm. and the fifth one is listening listening without love is empty sound you just don't get it. You know, it's just empty sound. But listening with love is understanding. Mm. So these five L's have given me a sort of a foundation on which to build and, and create my uh, other thinking processes that go on. Yeah. I mean, I can see that that's sort of like the inner compass, isn't it? It's, that's what keeps yes. bringing you back those values, that kind of the, you, the foundations that you build a life on and all of them are, you know, it's 
so simplistic, but incredibly profound as well. The last one, when you talk about the labor, labor with love and doing what lights us up and really fulfills us, you know, I think that part of that, that fulfillment of, yes, I could sit here talking, you know, podcasting and speaking to my clients and doing everything because I love it. But beforehand, I, I was doing other things that I, I wasn't, you know, and I was burnt out and I was exhausted. And that life force wasn't feeding me this energy that I, it just didn't, it was stagnant. And I only think when we make that decision of moving away from the shoulds and the needs, and I, I do understand like finances off, obviously come into it. But if we are willing to open our eyes and try and not be perfectionists, you know, have your mum's mentality of, what does she say? The, the could, the could do. Kuch parwane. Ah, uh, yes. Just explain Kuch that. Parwane. My sister and I were in our 90s. You know, we, I'm a slow learner, all right? <laughs> we were in our 90s and we were talking to each other and we'd do this and then we'd talk and then we'd do this. And we both stopped the, at the same time, and we looked at each other and we said, why do we do that? You know, and we said, well, who, who did it all the time? Just a lot. And we both said, mom and did it. And then we looked at each other and we said, why did she do that? We're in my, our 90s, okay? And, and finally, together, we both say, oh, kuch parwane, which in Hindustani means, Oh, it doesn't matter. And we realized that we had gotten to all kinds of things in our life because we had done this move hand movement and letting it go. In other words, say somebody says something nasty to you and you your hands out here and you take it in and you say, Oh, that's so mean. I'm Mm -hmm. so hurt and I'm so damaged, and I'm so, 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 and you just pull yourself right down, it, it, you could really get stuck with something that just, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So you t- instead of taking it into your heart, you take it and you kind of look at your hand and say, well, there it is. You hold it, and then you just let it drop and say, it doesn't matter. And you go on with what it is that you're doing. And you don't even remember what that was. Margaret and I had no idea how many th- times we could put one of things <laughs> in our lives, you know? It was yeah. just a, a hand movement that we did, that we took that and did it because that's the way mama did it, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like sort of the forgiveness, the releasing, the letting go and recognizing like there's so many things that we could be focusing that energy on. Let's not kind of like have that all that energy on sort of, um, you know, the toxic part of life, which it, it can be so easy just to fall into that negative spiral, always seeing the worst. And, you know, this is why people talk so much about gratitude now and really sort of trying to, you know, people who are really suffering mentally to be able to write five things down um, that they're grateful for every day because that redirects, you know, the neural pathways into seeing the good that's going on in our life. And the good is often a walk in nature, picking flowers, baking bread, you know, that's the stuff that keeps us going. Um, because like you say, the drudgery can very often bring us down. It really can. Before we go, I mean, I'm going to come back to your book just because there was a couple of um, little quotes that I, I found in your book, which really spoke to me. And I think the, the audience would really appreciate it because it really pulls out your personality, your traits, your brain. And it just made me sort of laugh a little bit, but also how you you are as a person. And I'm just now I'm trying to find it. There was the first, this, this one sort of made me giggle a little bit, is that you talked about, even when I'm asleep, I'm active. My whole body is humming with life. That's just the natural way my body wants to rest. True rest is action. It's meant to be something we do. It's not just the absence of doing anything at all. And so, and while we're resting, we're meant to think kind, gentle, regenerative thoughts about our body. We're meant to nourish ourselves, enjoying a slower pace and being fully present to what that is. And you say this is a far cry from laziness. And I know that so many of us, you know, struggle with this and we do have these restless brains, and restless energy and 
we struggle to sort of have downtime. And when we do have the downtime, we sort of, the guilt kicks in and we feel guilty about resting and guilty about you know, there's all these things, this productivity race that we're on. And actually it's in the rest, that's where the true energy and the action happens. And when we slow down, that's where the big things shift. And I just love the way you put that in your book. Has that been a big theme to your life? It's been, yes, it's been important. Uh, I take uh, rest every afternoon. I have for, for, oh, I don't know how many years. My mother did, I did, you know, have lunch. As long as I was working at in the office and with patients, I couldn't do it. But but after that, I could do it. And, and so I, you know, I schedule that. In other words, when you're resting, you're not doing nothing, you're doing something. And the something is the rest. You take a rest, like you take a walk or you take a drink. You take a rest. And so if you, if, if you can accept that resting process as for some of the important essence of your inner being and you use it that way looking for dreams looking for mm. how you feel when you wake up looking for you know what happens when you rest and it's um again repositioning and accepting what is now i want to put something else in here there are times when you have to stand up and speak your truth. I mean, there there are times when you just can't kuchpurwane. Yeah, it's the, the, they're too important. Uh, when I was, you know, working with the American Holistic Medical Association, there were times when I was called up about in in front of the medical community because I was either doing something or saying something that they didn't agree with and and I would be reprimanded, okay? <laughs> and this, I'm in front of my, the uh, committee and I get my reprimand and I'm, I pick up my purse and my uh, keys and I, key, I had my keys in a, a silver, safety pin that was about six inches long and it was a it was an instrument but I had that in my hand and my lawyer and I are walking out of the a conference room and this other doctor comes walking up to me one of the, one of the people in the committee and he says now let me tell you something honey boy that just it was like lighting a match you know and I turned around and I took my fist and I said you will not call me honey. <laughs> I'm your peer age-wise and professionally, and you will not call me honey. Well, the poor guy is just going down, <laughs> down like this. I turn around, my lawyer is leaning on the wall, laughing just then. When I came back to the office, my daughter, who was my partner, I told her, oh, she said, mom, you didn't. <laughs> but I did. It, I, I was really tired of having to, to present the things that I thought were so important to this committee who is forever telling me, like my psychiatrist, my medical school, sending me to, I mean, my, you know, you're crazy, go see the psychiatrist. Anyway, it was that kind of thing where I had to take a stand. But three years later, when I had to show up <laughs> the same thing this same doctor came up and he was really nice <laughs> you put him in his I place mean, that's why you taught you taught him a lesson <laughs> that's right so there are times when you're the things that are are important to us mm -hmm. are crucial to what it is we're doing that are not being recognized yes. and you just need to stand up for it yeah but that doesn't mean that you spend your time battling for it or that that's what you're really looking for. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I know that many of our, my audience will resonate with this trait of justice, the, you know, this really seeking justice and standing up for what we believe in and, and this passion and this almost sort of takes over us, you know, advocating for people who can't advocate themselves or helping people who are, you know, really suffering. And it's right. almost like our, it is very often our life force. And we, and we see lots of sort of people from our community working in these positions of just wanting to help and wanting to be of service. And that passion can be a real driver, but it can also be very emotive for us as well. So I, I very much understand. And that's what I love, you know, again, in your, in your book here and you, um, you know, you talk, you've talked, about, I'm not going to go into it now because I think people should read the book, but there's an element of you that um, you talk about your, your ex-husband and you said, you say here, as long as I let him win most arguments and take the leading role in our public life, my boisterous and curious nature was welcome. And I just believe that so many of us will relate to this, what you just describe as a boisterous and curious nature. And you describe that as a child as well. And that's what's seen you through. That's what's probably kept you so youthful as well, because you've asked those questions and you've not relented and you have broken that through those barriers and had that innovative thinking of knowing that there's another alternative, like knowing in your heart. I, I can see and understand that from the book and it's incredibly inspiring. And if we could just finish and maybe you could, you know, tell the listeners, what is it that has, do you believe has been, you know, obviously you can eat all the right fruits and vegetables and exercise and all of that is important, but what is it for you? Do you believe that has been your life force that has been that continual element to you that has kept you going for this long? Well, I think you mentioned it earlier, gratitude, because I am so grateful. I have no idea how come I've lived this long, but I'm grateful for it. When my daughter and I were doing a lecture together one time, after the lecture, people did this a lot. They came up and they were uh, asking me, what my secret was or something. And I was trying to come up with something cute or funny or something, and I couldn't come up with anything. But my, my I got my daughter's elbow as she p punched me, and she says, oh, mom, you do so on. You dwell in gratitude. And I said, yes, that's right, because she was able to put it into words, which I had been kind of shuffling off. It's It's the matter of understanding that we each one of us have a voice that needs to be heard and if uh, all the time i was deflecting my voice and saying uh, you know uh, well bill it, it it was it wasn't dr bill and dr gladys it was bill and gladys it was mm -hmm. i was the end on and uh, and I accepted that. Everybody accepted that. Nobody questioned it. But it was only after I found my own voice and began to claim what it was that I was saying that I began to really honor the fact that my voice was real. And of course, this is what my book is about. It's the reality of what I finally, <laughs> after years of talking about it and working with it and claiming it and so on, finally being able to put it down so that I think it makes sense for other people too. And because that, that was the intention. The, the title isn't a well-lived life, which is my life. Mm -hmm. It's a well-lived life of the person who's reading it. Yeah and how they're going to take this and, and use it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I think the way you, you know, written the book, it's so easy to relate in different ways. And, you know, you talk about the gratitude and I know, you know, from your story that you've got experienced the worst type of grief any parent could ever experience. And you've experienced heartbreak and divorce and lots of things. It's not like you've sort of lived a life there where nothing, you know, any positive things have happened, but you've always made that decision to go back to gratitude and sharing the wisdom and looking, looking for the lessons, looking for how we can move forwards. And it's incredibly 
inspiring and motivating. And I'm so grateful to you for writing Thank this book you. because I have had this on my bedside table and mm. I've finished it and I'm going to read it again. <laughs> and I've shared you. it a lot. I've shared it, you know, on my social media and I've shared it with friends. And um, and I hope that through this podcast interview, lots of people will go and read it because these are the books that we need in these times. You know, these times, right. is, this is what we need to be hearing um, because through everything we, you know, we've got this whole social media thing going on, which is just poison to, in so many ways, in some good ways, but also in so many horrible ways. So it's this type of thing that we need to to hold on to. So, you know, Dr. Gladys, thank you so, so much for being here. Um, It's been an absolute delight and honor. Thank you. Thank you for shining your light. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. I hope you found what you were looking for in this conversation and it has helped guide you towards some further self-healing, self-exploration, and most importantly, self-acceptance. And if you have enjoyed this conversation and would like to experience more of my work, such as access to exclusive live workshops and opportunities for group coaching sessions, connecting with other like-minded women, and a general feeling of belonging, please come and check out my monthly membership, the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Collective. I've made it as affordable as possible and I offer you lots of resources and opportunities for connection and support from other women all around the world being diagnosed with ADHD later on in life. I'd absolutely love to see you there. All the details are in this episode's show notes or on my website adhdwomenswellbeing.co.uk. See you in the next episode.